Hey guys, quick disclaimer, this was originally a part of a much longer video, but then I went on vacation and after I came back, I realized it's probably better to just release all of this information into individual videos, so just keep that in mind because this is just the tip of the One Punch Man iceberg that I'm going to be taking you guys down. Uh, it doesn't really get crazy crazy until I start going into the Egypt stuff, which is going to be released in videos after this one, so... Enjoy, guys. All right, now that we got that out of the way, let's get into it because I've been working on this video for like two months. If you've been wondering why I haven't been talking about the God stuff, you know, since we saw him, you know, reveal in chapter 153 or, or whatever it's going to be, you know, wound up being numbered by Marada and one. But it's because when I saw that, like God come in front of Homeless Emperor, you know, the iconic colored spread. That was the beginning of the end for me. That caused me to go in a rabbit hole that I am only now showing the world. So I'll show you the path that I took and where it eventually leads, which is us knowing everything about the series, basically. So when God appeared in front of Homeless Emperor and we saw like his meaty, boneless form, it reminded me immediately of Hellraiser, a movie that I had just coincidentally seen a couple months prior. Honestly, I, there's no reason I would have seen this movie except for someone just suggested it to me and I just happened to watch it and I thought it was interesting and I wound up watching the sequel right after it, but that's where it ended until I saw this depiction of God. So then my mind started racing and instead of using Occam's razor, I started using Zonin's razor, but surprisingly, it actually led me to the truth. So then I watched Hellraiser, and then I was like, oh my god, one loves Hellraiser and or Clive Barker's writing. And then I watched Hellraiser 2, and then I was like, oh my god, he really does. And then I watched Hellraiser 3, and I was like, okay, this is it. This is where this part of the story is coming from. But then when I finished Hellraiser 3, it led me to the ultimate truth. So let me just explain Hellraiser to you real quick before I go into these movies. So essentially, Hellraiser is about these cubes. I know, cubes, right? And we'll get into it. Anyway, these cubes exist in the world. And if you find them and can solve it, then you like open this dimension to like a hell-like world where these Cenobites come through the, you know, the iconic pinhead character that we see. And they give you an experience that is pain and pleasure indivisible. That's essentially what Hellraiser is about. What's that? You said my hoodie looks familiar and you want to see what it says? Well, let me turn the lights on. That's right, guys. It's Saitama's Opie hoodie from One Punch Man. And you can get this too by visiting the sponsor of this video, Fandomaniacs. Not only did I get this sweet hoodie from Fandomaniacs, but I also got this amazing Todoroki shirt, which all the ladies love. Got this incredible Tokyo Jujitsu High hoodie with the aesthetic JJK logo on the back, of course. And then I have this amazing one piece sweater that has no business being as cool as it is. And yeah, Christmas is over, but there's December every year and I can wear it for 31 days out of that month. So guys, please check Check out Fandom Maniacs. Look at the testimonials. They love it. I love it. Check it out. Link is in the description. And you can use the coupon code ZONE10 for 10% off of your purchase. Thanks, guys. So Hellraiser 1 opens up with this couple, Julia and Larry, going to this house. Now, this house is, I guess, Larry's or something, and his brother, Frank, was living there. But his brother, like, I don't know, died upstairs in his room or something. Julia and Larry go upstairs and whatever happens and Larry winds up getting cut on his hand and the blood drips onto the floor and goes beneath the floorboards and like the, I don't know, residual corpsiness of Frank that was left behind absorbs the blood and he starts to come back as like a circulatory system or just a base form of a human. So that right there was the beginning of the end. Because if you haven't seen where I'm going right now, you're about to. So remember when Orochi first died by Saitama before all the retcons, even though it doesn't matter because it's still going to all line up the same way. But anyway, when Orochi came back, he was like that goopy heart form and all that he wanted was blood, right? Because blood would make him regain his strength. Well, coincidentally, that is the same thing that Frank wants in this movie. He wants blood to regain his strength so that he regains his form to come back to the real world. Well, now you're saying, well, that's not Orochi. Of course it's not, it's God. 
This is the story of God. But um, let's just keep going more into the, uh, the Hellraiser stuff. So Frank explains that he was trapped in the Hell Dimension and the blood that dripped onto the floor from his brother was able to like somehow bring him back. Clive Barker, the director and writer of Hellraiser, doesn't really explain this too much in the movie. I guess because the studio thought maybe they have to cut back on the exposition because, you know, the normies watch and wouldn't be able to follow it. But anyway, this relationship that we're seeing here is essentially the same as Psychos and Orochi and God. Because this woman, Julia, is Psychos, but they are both based off of the same character and I'll get into that later on. So later on in Hellraiser, we see this homeless guy uh, with long black hair and a beard. I know, iconic to homeless people, but also similar to another person that we're familiar with from One Punch Man. Maybe it's just a coincidence, but you know, maybe everything in this video is a coincidence and confirmation bias. Let me just get that out of the way, because obviously this is all not proven yet, and it doesn't matter how confident I am, this could all just not be true in the end. But anyway, we see this homeless guy in the movie throughout, and he's always like watching them. Whoever is involved with the cube or tied to the people who are involved with the cube. So that's pretty interesting, right? Homeless Emperor, if you haven't caught on to where I'm trying to make the connection yet. So Julia loves Frank because things that I can't really talk about on YouTube, but she'll do anything for him, such as bring him innocent people for him to drain their blood so that he can regain his form. Uh, and he does this slowly. Like first he comes back as like the circulatory system and the goopiness or whatever. Then he gains some nerves and more tissue and stuff. But then he gains like muscle and ligaments and it winds up coming down to him needing skin as like the final layer. And that's kind of how we see God, right? Or at least the three versions that we see of God. Yes, this is all one God. It's not three different ones, or at least I'm pretty sure it's not. That's because it's representing the same kind of dynamic that's going on here. God needs all of this blood because like Frank here, he needs to regain his form. What we see of him in this fetal position is where he is currently. Like he's at the musculature form and him coming back to earth, I'm assuming will give him his skin, but uh, you know, we'll get more into that later. Anyway, towards the end of the movie, the MC Christie winds up solving the cube and she goes to like the hell razor dimension and then suddenly these creatures are able to come through into her world essentially monsters if you will and i think that's a pretty interesting part here because uh, you know this could be telling us the origin of monsters but anyway at the end of the movie a homeless emperor collects the cube and then transforms into some bone demon devil monster and then flies away so i looked into this guy and it turns out he is the cube guardian He's always depicted as some kind of like homeless gentleman or something. So that right there is obviously a connection to Homeless Emperor with God and everything, you know, so in case you were wondering, that's where I guess one got the idea for Homeless Emperor because that is kind of like a bizarre idea for a character, right? All right, so if you thought that was interesting, well, just get ready because we're going to Hellraiser 2 now. This is like where Clive Barker, I guess, was given free reign by the studio and was allowed to do almost anything he wanted, which is also why I guess Hellraiser imploded the way that it did. But anyway, opening up with Hellraiser 2, we see Pinhead as a human with the cube. It turns out that Pinhead was a soldier during the war. They don't make it explicit what war it is, but I guess it was like World War II or something. And the cube took him to the Hellraiser dimension. So this means that Pinhead, uh, the Cenobite, the demon, was once a human. So then later on in the movie, we see that there are multiple cubes that exist, not just one just like in One Punch Man. And then this next stuff that I'm gonna be going into isn't explained in the movie, and in fact, I'm pretty sure we only see it for like one frame. We see like this newspaper that says, Children of the Vortex, puberty link with psychic phenomena. Uh-oh, there's the keyword, psychic, cube, god. All three of these words are in Hellraiser, but they're also in One Punch Man, and they all connect the same way. The Trinity, that's where this is all headed, guys. Everything is connected by three. Not just with One Punch Man, but just stories and writing and everything. But the main trinity, aside from God, Cube, Psychic, is Hellraiser, One Punch Man, but they all connect 
to Egypt or Egyptian mythology. Because the next thing that we see in this sequence is Egyptian iconography behind this doctor guy who is Orochi. I know, I'll get into it. So this is where it really started to get out of control because once I saw the Egypt stuff, it made me think about the Egypt stuff that we saw in the table of contents of volume 21 or volume 23, I don't remember. It's gonna say it right here, this is the volume number. But there's Egyptian stuff there and also when we see the mural, you know, for the prophecy of God, it's like Egyptian hieroglyphics inspired, right? It looks like that stuff. So that's telling me that it is true. All of this is dating back to Egyptian times. That's where this is all kind of starting, not just for One Punch Man, but for Hellraiser. So also during this sequence, we see like this mattress. Now, remember when I said uh, in Hellraiser 1, in Frank's room, he like died there or something so that when blood was placed on the area where he died, he was able to absorb the blood and then come back to the real world. Well, when Julia died in the first movie, she died on this mattress. And this doctor guy, who was a Rochi, by the way, has one of his patients bleed on this mattress and that completes the ritual to bring Julia back from the cube world, similar to how the mural was with the altar. You know, place a worthy sacrifice, our God will come back, blah, blah, blah. So then later on, we see this little girl and we're starting to see, okay, children of the vortex, puberty link with psychic phenomenon. This little girl is always kind of like working on puzzles and stuff. That's like her thing in this movie. She doesn't really talk. But anyway, this little girl is Tatsumaki. Let's just get that out of the way here. But anyway, later on, we come back to Julia, AKA Psychos, who has now regained her form, just like how Frank did in the first movie by absorbing the blood of people that the doctor had brought her. Pretty interesting colored dress that she's wearing now, right? But anyway, we're coming to the MC Christy from the first movie, who's actually Fubuki. And Fubuki and Tatsumaki get together here and start basically figuring out a way to solve the plot of this movie. And it starts coming together that, oh, Tatsumaki is here because she was being experimented on by the doctor to work with the cube so that they could summon the Cenobites, AKA God, so that she can work with the cube to get the power of God, because that's where this is all headed. But anyway, Tatsumaki was also in like a lab type facility when she was younger, obviously, and we saw when Blast broke her out of there, he had a cube in his hand. So that straight up confirms for sure that Tatsumaki was in that psychic facility for the cube. They bought her, by the way, that's like her backstory. She was purchased by these lab people, by her foster parents. Keep that in mind. Tatsumaki is an orphan, so is Fubuki, because we're gonna get into that. But yeah, they wanted Tatsumaki to use her psychic abilities to awaken the power of the cube. And I guess they did to an extent, because like we see in Hellraiser 2, the girl does open the dimension by solving the cube. I'm assuming Tatsumaki does the same thing, and that's how that big monster comes. Because that's essentially where all monsters come from. They're like some kind of alien or interdimensional species or something. I'll get more into it. But anyway, back to the movie. When Fubuki and Tatsumaki reactivate the cube and they meet Pinhead again, we see that Pinhead remembers Christie's name. But also it's a callback to the first movie that Pinhead remembered Frank. He keeps track of all of the people that he has made deals with, just like how God has, right? Or at least we're led to believe that. God remembered the name of Blast, which insinuated that he has a history with Blast because he does. Not because Blast made a deal with God. Uh, I, I think he might be similar to Tatsumaki, but we'll get into that. So we come back to Psychos with human Orochi, and they're in the god world now, and Psychos is revealing to human Orochi who her god is, and it turns out that it's Leviathan, the god of the labyrinth. This guy right here, this is our boy. This is God. But, you know, it's not like God is him and he is God. Both of these guys are based off of the same character, just like Psychos and Julia, and just like the Doctor and Orochi. Also, fun little fact, in this sequence, Leviathan is making this horn sound, which apparently is Morse code for God. Leviathan telling everyone that he is God, despite him, you know, not literally being God similar to how God does in One Punch Man. But anyway, we see that Psychos tricks the doctor and gives him to God on the altar, and it transforms the doctor into this monstrosity who is a Rochi. Like, look, you know, like, 
they're both Orochi. Because like I said, they're both based off of the same deity. It all goes back to the snake stuff. Another interesting thing about this hell world that they're in, the labyrinth that Leviathan looks over, it's very similar to like the Monster Association. Obviously it's not one for one recreation. I mean, we saw that one area was already an area that exists in Indonesia or something. But for the most part, like the architecture and why it looks all weird and labyrinthy like that, it's because of this. But anyway, later on in the movie, uh, it's revealed that the Cenobites were in fact all humans once, you know, like we talked about in the first movie. But then for some reason, they wind up fighting the Orochi Cenobite guy. I don't know why, it's never really explained. They're both serving the same god. But look how he fights. He like shoots lasers and stuff. That's pretty interesting, right? I mean, aside from just using like the dragon snake tentacle hands. But also, he's fighting Tatsu Tatsumaki here because you know like how Tatsumaki fights Orochi in One Punch Man because you know like I said they're both based off of the same thing these two characters fight each other in the mythology anyway and I know this is a little hard to believe because you know I'm not equating this to Japanese mythology maybe you'd believe me if I said crab has conflict with dog so I understand it's a little hard to believe that psychic girl has conflict with snake monster <laughs> Anyway, Tatsumaki does something and eventually winds up defeating Orochi and therefore God at the same time, but not like killing God, but I don't know, foiling his plan. And when the like souls are implied, I guess, to be escaping from him, they look like homeless emperor's light spheres. But anyway, at the end of the movie, we come back to the altar, the mattress once again, and like this pillar comes out of it and we see homeless emperor's face again. But that takes us to the third movie, which is by far the worst of the three. And we come back to this altar that has come out of the ground, but now we see that Pinhead is taking up the role of the person who tries to convince a human to give them blood or a sacrifice to bring them back to the world. But we essentially get the, you know, prophecy, Orochi, bringing back God thing here. And it leads to Pinhead coming back to the world and killing humanity because he hates them for some reason, similar to God. But anyway, we're getting more information on the backstory of Pinhead because his human consciousness, which came back in the second movie, when the doctor shot him with a Orochi's beam and made him become a human again, that like separated him from his pinhead monster consciousness. Again, this was like written in 1990 or, or something, so you know, things were different then. But anyway, I'm telling you this for a reason because this human consciousness of the original form of pinhead meets the MC of this movie in what he says a limbo between heaven and hell. It's like uh, connects dreams or something. This is the place that we see like Psychos and Fabuki and Phoenix Man and Child Emperor go to. This is like that Esper meeting ground that, that they've always been going to. This could be also the same place where we see God take Homeless Emperor. It's basically like this neutral ground where people that have this like Esper ability or whatever can meet and talk. But anyway, he says, I can't act in your world, but you can. The war destroyed my generation. He says something like if they weren't killed by the war then like drugs and vices killed them but drugs and vices weren't his thing he more so was like seeking thrills so he went out and found the laminate configuration which is the cube in the hellraiser lore and he inadvertently became a servant of leviathan here and we do know that there was a war in one punch man or actually many wars and i'll get into that because i'm pretty sure god is the reason for those wars i'm pretty positive there is a character from the war who like became monstrified because of it and maybe didn't want to be and they possibly exist right now in the story but we're not aware of who they are. But anyway, remember I said Pinhead is released from the pillar and he's like killing people and stuff. And he gives this monologue about hating humans for some reason, similar to how God does. And, uh, but also Pinhead needs the cube to be given to him. He cannot take it. And he wants to destroy the cube because if he destroys the cube, then there's no longer a portal between the Hellraiser world and Earth so that Pinhead can always stay in Earth and rule it essentially, I guess. Pin is also able to like deceive people and make kind of like genjutsus, like he can go into your mind and then make you think that he's somebody else and convince you of something, you know, that typical villainous trope ability. But I think that might come back into play in the later parts of the story, maybe. And you might see that correlate to another lore that this is based off of as well. But anyway, the movie ends with like Pinhead getting sealed again by his human form in the MC. I don't know, it doesn't really matter. But the ending shot of the movie ends with us seeing like this corporation and the laminate configuration markings are all over it. It means that, you know, Leviathan even has influence over the corporate world, which of course, 
is an element going into One Punch Man. So that's gonna be it for this one. I really appreciate you guys checking this video out. And like I said in the beginning, there's going to be many follow-up videos to this one where I'm gonna be going into the Egypt stuff and what is very likely going to be happening in the plot of the story after the Neo Heroes arc is over. So subscribe for that. And uh, again, thanks guys.